And uh, so it was hypotensive. He'd been given some crystalloid by the paramedics uh, with no response, so fluid refractory hypotension, and he had to hang for that. So the ED resident sensor <coughs> thought this might be a AAA and did an ultrasound scan, which we'll look at. But it did not show an abdominal mammal scanning. But the cool thing was he recognized that this patient was hypotensive, and that that is bad because hypotension is a warning sign. Like this warning sign here on the roads of rural Australia. Does anyone know what that animal is? In? Wombat. It's a wombat. Excellent. Well done. Yeah. It's a wombat. Yeah. And the wombats are on the warning sign. And if they don't read the warning sign, they die. So that's a dead wombat. <laughs> All right. Anyone who's from Australia is not, or lives in Australia, is not allowed to answer this. But for a free, free <laughs> t-shirt, <laughs> feels so weird. <laughs> um, so, what kind of animal is a wombat? It's a mammal, or what kind of animal? Fruit salad. A marsupial. And what makes a marsupial special? How? And what's unique about the wombat's pouch? If you compare, for example, the kangaroo. I don't know. Back. Yeah, yeah. 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 Who said upside down? You get the t shirt. There you go. I have no idea why you want this. It doesn't matter that I made up the answer. Right. You made up well. That's cool. There's a one that thinks grows and it will uh, kind of scratch around and pull the lungs towards it. And if it had a pouch that would light way up, there's a jolly one that, a baby one that would get in the day and lose mark. So it goes in from, from underneath. There you go. Right, if there's one thing you will remember from this conference, it's great. Round the one that's about to go. Okay, so this, this patient was hypotensive, and that's a worry. And, and hypotension, when it gets really bad, is called what? And when it gets really, really bad? Yeah. yeah. Slightly before that, but it's so interested in what happens. Cardiac arrest, okay? PEA cardiac arrest. If you're so hypotensive, you can't feel the pulse. The pulse still be in this either. And who can give me all the courses of PEA, PEA arrest really quickly? Go! Oh. No, that's what I thought. Because we use the H's and T's to try and remember them. But, and then there is a good way of learning the list and regurgitating it during the exam. But really, I've never seen anyone produce this list in this order rapidly and accurately in a cardiac arrest. And if they do, it kind of, it's kind of inappropriate. So, you know, someone's going to ride over by a bus, someone's going to have hyperthermia, uh, lots of ingestion. Soon they've been running over by a bus. I don't think so. <laughs> so, there's a better way, I think, of, of going through the causes of cardiac arrest and extreme hypertension. Um, and that's, the, I didn't make this up, it's the three plus three rule. So, there are three main causes of hypertension, of shock, cardiac arrest. Volume, obstruction, and pump. And there are three main causes of obstruction tension in the thorax, tamponade, and pulmonary And that's three plus three. What's nice about this is it rapidly gives you stuff to look for and stuff you can be treating. And okay, hypothermia is not in here, drug overdose is in here, but they will cause pump failure. So that they are in here, it's not obvious. So I can rapidly, through my clinical assessment, history, and sonography, Work out whether there's a volume of pump problem or whether there's one of course in construction in a few seconds. And that's something we're going to talk about, that's something we're going to practice today. So here's, uh, here's our fella. He, um, he was hypotensive and the triple A scan, the abdominal muscle scan, did not show an aneurysm dilatation. So we put the echo break in his heart. Like this is a sub cost of view. We will practice this this morning during fast scan. Yeah. Got fluid around the heart and scavenging the thrombus in, uh, in that space. So he's got correct by the fusion in the context of shock that's probably tamponade. He also has some features of tamponade physiology. Now, when you've got tamponade, you have a pressure in your pericardial space that exceeds the pressure in the right side of the heart during diastole. So the heart can't fill. That's what makes you shock. It's what makes you shock. It's not the blood part out of the heart. Blood part is easy. So you get right atrial or right ventricular diastolic collapse. And the heart going is fast, and we're very used to kind of ultrasound, that's kind of hard to see, but it was described by someone smart for me that it looks like someone's jumping 
So that's a feature of Tampon physiology. And on the apical four chamber view, you can see through it around the heart here. Yeah. And if you look at the guy's eye, you see it's fat inducing and non fat in the respiration. And the MO that you see in variation in the throughout the cycle. We're going to cover all this stuff again. So he had a tampon that came on suddenly. I went back and reviewed the abdominal water. Images and uh, they also being this one here on the right, total dissection. That uh, in sonography, we can diagnose type A dissection. It's completely fitting with that history, um, and the industry did uh, well. That was quite satisfying. So, the fastest morning is basic echo, basic diagnostic between the fast and the chest. Well, it's similar, but we use a different probe, we use a cardiac probe. Because it has to have a small footprint to look through between the ribs. The orientation is different, so the um, the probe marker will always, on the on the actual transducer will always correspond to the little marker on the screen. But when we're doing an abdominal scan, that's on the left side of the screen. When we put the echo settings on the machine, that flips to the right hand side of the screen. But it will still respond to the probe marker and. You don't have to worry about that, you just have to do an echo in a certain way. And I'll talk through and we'll practice it in the demonstrations, holding the probe in a certain way and speaking to the same sequence every time so we never get confused about which way around it is. Some echo machines have ECG leads, so you can put ECG dots on and monitor the rhythm um, with the images. Standard echo scan have that. It's not necessary when you're doing uh, resuscitative decision making with bedside cardiac processor. And patient positioning is important, and I'll come back to that. And then the modes. We've got 2 dB mode, which this talk will focus mainly on. Okay, that's the standard black and white views we're we'll interested in used to seeing. N mode we can use for certain measurements. If you're interested in that, I personally don't believe you need to make any measurements. Do a basic cardiac scan on the resuscitation. And Doc was mentioned by Mike earlier, we won't cover that at all in this talk. So I said we talked about positioning. In any procedure in medicine, we have to get the position right to optimize our chance of success. We would dream of having a patient in a bad position for an endoscopy and intubation, or when you do a lumbar puncture. And it's the same with echo. Now, if you have the luxury of an awake operative patient, you can put them onto their left side. Have the hand, sorry, it's a bit embarrassing to change that face there. But you can um, <laughs> put them over onto their left side, and that helps the heart fall away from the sternum. And if they put their hand up behind their head, that will help spread the ribs of the heart as well. You need to see the heart. So I tell patients to just imagine you're a model for a car magazine, a bit of a bikini, and you're sprawled out on the front of the sports car. And the things tend to kind of break apart at that point. But, <laughs> you can think of a better way to explain that. Try and get them in that position if they want. And then we're going to do four views. So there are, there are more views that you can do, but in this talk, most of the practice will concentrate on these four views. We have a parasternal long axis view. This is my favorite view. It's not the most intuitive view the first time you start echoing, but it's just great. The short axis view, the apical four chamber view, and the subcostal four chamber view, which more so we don't really need to speak about that in really great detail, but we will cover how to assess the improvement in the chamber. So we'll start with the parasternal long axis view. Now, if I were to get a magician to the system and put her, it's usually at her, on a table and get a saw and start sawing her in a fairly asymmetric pattern, going from right shoulder to left hip. I'd be doing a parasternal long axis slice through that MA patient system. And I go through the skin first, and then I go through sternum, and then I go through pericardium. What will I get to next? The right ventricle, the right ventricle output tract. Here's a cadaver specimen. So we've got right ventricle output tract, 
Then we've got the um, interventional septum, got the rest of the left ventricle here, we've got left atrium here, mitral valve, that's the chamber of the left ventricle. This is the aortic valve. So blood will go out the right ventricle, out the left ventricle, around the lungs, come into the left atrium, through the mitral valve, into the left ventricle. These muscles will squeeze together and push blood out through the left ventricle, the outflow tract, through the aortic valve, and around the body. Okay? Not an intuitive view of most of the sort of stuff doing this, but repetition is the mother of skill. And what I'd like you to do if you are new to this is get as familiar as you can with what you are supposed to look like and then start sticking the program and try to achieve that view. It's going to be fairly easy to interpret with these stuff. So, slicing through right shoulder to left hip, starting at about the fourth intercostal space, just to the left of the sternum. Up or down the space, you can't find it. It's going to look like that. This, these images are uh, borrowed from this fantastic website here. From, um, the, the Atlas of Echo Party, I'll put a link to that on the resource from the site. Uh, the there are examples of this for every slice. So, coming back to the parasitical alliances view, white ventricle valve, they track the septum, the rest of the ventricle, white valve, AQ. Right, then the ventricle down the track, they also found proximal water. Has anyone in the room not seen that view before? I'm not sure if you've seen that view before. It's going to get boring. I keep going on about it. There's a few of you fantastic. But let's do it again. Repetition is a mother's skill. So, uh, right ventricle down the track, septum, there's the left ventricle there, this is the mitral valve, left atrium. Left ventricle, the aortic valve, So I do a basic echo, a bit like a bar scan, and yes, no question. So the bar scan, is there a fluid around the heart? The start up here, I'm kind of going like that. Count the problem. There's a fluid around the heart? No. Then I want to look at the RV. So I can do a bit of a Does it look bigger than the left ventricle? Is it pushing down and flattening that septum? What would that be a feature of potentially? Massive P or anything that could cause poor pulmonary, they raise the right side pressure. So is the RV bigger than the RV tissue now? Now I have an idea of pump function. Is the LV wall contracting evenly all the way around? And is the chamber size getting smaller consistently compared to diastole? By definition, that's ejection fraction and the amount of this. If the chamber size shrinks consistently compared to diastole, Give you an idea of ejection fraction. We don't need a percent, we don't need a number. We need a global visual assessment to see if this is likely to be a pump problem causing this patient's hypotension shock or perilous situation. But is that contracting even all the way around? Is the chamber size getting smaller and consistently with her capacity? And also look at this anterior mitral valve injury. It should get fairly close to the septum if it gets forward. If that doesn't go anywhere near the septum, that can be an indirect marker or pump. So, we can't really do a volume assessment directly here, but we can look for obstruction. And for our massive PE, we can look for content. And we're done with the most part of you. And we're now going to rotate the probe. It's a orientated marker going to the left shoulder. We're going to place from left shoulder to right hip, remember, to form across the space, to the left sternum. I'm now rotating that probe 90 degrees round and doing a short axis slice. Now, if I gave you someone's heart, and said, I want to make sandwiches. Can you just chop the heart up and put it between the slices of bread? I gave you a sharp knife and a heart. You would probably do short axis slices. You'd probably start the apex and make these fairly nice round slices to put it in the sandwiches. I bet you would. Um, so <laughs> that's what we're looking at here. You start the apex and slice it down to fairly round slices. And the left ventricle is the round, thick, warm one here. And the right ventricle is thin, kind of wrapped around it. A bit, a bit like kind of a Chinese salute. So you've got thick or left ventricle, thin or right ventricle around it. This low pressure thin or right ventricle, if it's under a higher pressure, for example, in massive, some massive form like this, it's going to push out, it's going to push on that septum and flatten it. That can actually make the left ventricle look like a kind of capital D rather than a circle. 
high control of ground effect. So that would be a feature of one side of pressure in a flatly nice setting. So here's a parasitical short axis view. You've got the left ventricle contracting fairly evenly all the way around. You've got the inner wall, right ventricle, and the back front track of the left around the outside. And I ask myself the same questions. Is there fluid around the part of the eye? Is the right ventricle bigger than the left ventricle pushing on the septum? Is the left ventricle contracting evenly all the way around? And the chamber size getting smaller and consistently periodicity. At this particular level, that's the mitral valve of the middle of the body. Um, and these letters here just remind us that that's the septum, the anterior wall, the lateral wall, the inferior wall. You might see a regional animation down the mountain. Now, I've been lucky enough to have a few good mentors in my cardiac ultrasound training, and a fairly recent one's Iris T. She's great, and uh, she works in Sydney. She taught me a lot, and I wanted to thank her. For the training that she gave me, and so I bought her some <coughs> snacks, some Chinese snacks called June Doi. And I bought her the June Doi and uh, sliced them on a Mrs. Creek cup. I just explained that in science, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so here's another short axis view, and then if you look at this one, let's say a patient came in with a bit of chest pain and some equivocal anterior ST segment change on the ECG, I'm not really sure what to do, I'm not really sure if it's cardiac or not, then you get this short axis view. Is it good around the heart? No. Is it hardly bigger than the pelvic pushing on the septum? Is that anything? No. Is it pelvic contracting evenly all the way around? No. What do you see? The septum isn't really moving much here, is it? This is bad down here, but that's not really the thing. So that's a septal regional movement. I think that's cool, isn't it? It's even. Okay, and then the apical four chamber view. So we removed the flow from here, rotated it 90 degrees clockwise. Now we're just sliding it down to the point of maximum impulse, and the flow mark is going to be roughly facing the patient's left hand side. We're going to get this view, and this is the view everyone wants to get because it looks like how we imagine a heart to be before the chamber. Yeah, if you lift it upside down, you can see that on a Valentine's card. So you've got the right ventricle, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the left ventricle. But personally, I find this view one of the hardest to get, particularly if patients have blood pressure issues. So if you had a patient like this, <laughs> it would be quite, potentially quite difficult to get a good A4 before chamber view. Um, I've been asked by Mike just to leave this up for a, for a little while in case any of you wish to masturbate. Let's move on. So, <coughs> do you have any tricks for getting good A for you? Because it does seem to be a lot harder than the first thing you use. Uh, I don't have any specific tricks, but um, in my experience, I was trying to. When Iris, whom I showed you, was supervising me, she'd go out the room, I'd do an echo study, she'd come in and assess it. And there was a lady with a lot of breast tissue, and uh, I was, I guess, uh, being gentle, trying to go around the breast, trying to lift it, um, just trying to find that point of maximum impulse. And I told Iris, I can't get a good eight or four chamber view. And she just stuck the code right into the breast, just dug it straight through the breast tissue to get it. I'm not, I'm not recommending that, but. Um, it just kind of showed, I guess, that experience is not always going to work out all ways and going to all sorts of notes to get the views they want to get. Um, what I would say that from an emergency medicine point of view, a bedside decision making and a resus room point of view, I don't think you need all four views. You know, we've seen that you can spot ten and one view. I think you need some options though. And I think it's good to be able to go trans abdominally or trans thoracically. So I, I might combine them. Uh, Parasitic long axis view, which is my favorite, with a subcostal four chamber view. There's patients who are on positive pressure ventilation or have emphysema, their lung have a lot of expanded lung, it would be difficult to get a trans thoracic view. You may be obliged to go trans abdominal. Patients with big, tense abdomens, you might not be able to get the right angle to look up into the chest, and therefore you have to have a trans thoracic option. It's very rare you have to do all four of them, so I'm happy to only get all four of 
for China because I'm, I'm there and there. Uh, there's a sub cost of uh, four chamber at the end of the week. Okay, let's so look at some cases. So, a male age 14 comes in with dyspnea and hypertension. This was when I'd done an echo course but didn't have a machine that was itching, itching to start ultrasounding heart. And uh, this guy had increasing breathlessness over two weeks. And he previously did well. And he had muffled heart sounds, hypertension, and he has JVP. So, a classic, try that. And I was seeing another patient, and my resident came to me and said, Hey, Cliff, where do we keep the pericardiosynthesis needles? And I said, Oh, I've served all down in recent months. I said, Thanks. Said, Why? Hang on. <laughs> and uh, he, he'd taken this chest x ray. <coughs> and he said, Look, he's got all the signs, and he's got this big, long, and hard shadow. It's got pericardial diffusion. It's causing tank. Okay, but the guy, yeah, he was obviously sick, but he didn't look at him, he didn't look like the sound of my patients. I'd seen him with a main class. Um, so I thought we needed an echo, um, but I was looking if he could get one out of ours, and but I knew where they kept the old machine that they didn't lock up, so in the cardiology department, and I knew there would be no one there because it was the evening <laughs> on a weekend. <laughs> So I was free to go and take whatever I wanted on challenge. I borrowed the machine and I was the first taker. So this is a normal comparison and this is what this guy had. So it's an April 4 chamber view. Here, for the sake of completeness and repetition, we're going to go around it. Is there fluid around the heart? No. Is the RV bigger than the LV, flattening the septum? No. Is the pump, the LV pump, contracting evenly and it's all the way around and the chamber size gets this all the system? Yes, so that's normal here. Is there fluid around the heart? No. We could have stopped there, that would have been, well, I might say, for a hint. Because he doesn't have very high diffusion, so he can't tap an answer. But then he will go down and step away from the room. Is the RV being in the LV? No, and it's not flattening the septum. Is the LV more contracting? And I see all the way around the chain size getting small. No, it's got a cracky projection fraction. It's got globally in the head, so much. Our job is done, we don't need a diagnosis, he's got a pump problem, uh, it's not going to kill him right now, and he actually, despite his hypertension, responded quite well to the small dose of diuretic. Um, he had a dilated cardiomyopathy, he's got a thin wall dilated chamber, but that doesn't matter, it's a pump, it's a pump problem, we can make the right decision. Just another thing to mention, uh, in terms of assessing pump in this plane, in this uh, April view, if you look at the AV valve, so the tricuspid valve here and the mitral valve here, they move up and down in a normal function of pump. And if you've got impaired pump function, there's less up down It's not an impaired normal axis function. Question. Yeah. Was that your case? That was, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's. Do you remember what his superior view table looked like? If it looked like he would respond to fluid or not? Uh, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, I can't remember, but I bet it was big and fat and juicy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So this is his parastemal or axis view. This is a normal down here comparison. Is there fluid around the heart? No, is the only the only fat except no, it's unfunctioning well. Emptying in cystic endodiastole with evenly contracting muscle and an anterior mitral valve that goes about septum. Yes. Um, this one, the fluid around the heart, hasn't got a big RV, but it's got a bad pump. You look at that anterior mitral valve bit, but no, that's the septum. That's the anterior mitral valve bit. It's nowhere near. See how that's a helpful marker for pump function? Have some short axis view. This is the patient. You can see the pump is not working well. It's kind of rotting or flapping around a plastic bag in the wind. Okay, subcostal view we practiced this morning in plus scan, same four chambers as early on in April 14. Right, let's look at this one. A male in his 70s, found on the floor, hypotensive and cold. He looked kind of center clausian, big and round, big beard, bibs big dirty, and he's more centers to be. And he'd been on the floor all night 
and uh, he was cold and he was highly intensive. And Resin had given him five meters of crystal weight and said, We need to put a central line in this guy. I don't want to overload him. Uh, we still have good tendency. I said, Okay, central line's on. Maybe we need to go and get this. Have a little look. Now, these are crappy scans because this is the real world. Um, really big, very easy patient. So you can the parastatal one has to view. No, put it around the heart, it's not a big RV. Actually, I'm busy, isn't it? Very vigorous, it's maybe like a little bit like that. Okay, let's go on to some function. Uh, Atrial for chain review, good up down wiggle for the lady mouth and that ventricle looking quite busy. Subcostal view, not too bad. That doesn't scream pump failure to me, does it? You look at this IBC, this is tempo. So it's really skinny and it completely collapses every time it breathes in. So I thought that was helpful. I thought that was a sign that he was probably still hyperbolic despite of that. Of course, we would be warming at the same time, so probably naked space as we go to the aid. So we gave him some more fluid and more fluid and more fluid going by this. In fact, when we put a central line in, the CPU was one. So this was a good reflection. We were able to comfortably give him some more food for us to And then he died. So, <laughs> let's talk about scanning the IBC. <laughs> so, people erroneously, in my view, talk about this as a volume assessment. In a way, it is, it's assessing whether you think you can safely give more volume, but it isn't really telling you the patient's volume status. Not usually. It doesn't give us as much information as we'd like to do, I think. There's a lot of debate about this, and hopefully we'll hear some of that debate later on in this conference. But what we really need to take home from a basic equation is you need to be able to spot the difference between this and this. Okay? This is a fat, juicy IVC that isn't breathing with respiration, and this is a thin IVC that collapses with respiration. M mode is a good way of quantifying. That difference in the spiritual cycle, in fact. Okay. What does it mean? Well, the essential take home is that if you've got a small IPC that's collapsing a lot, they probably are going to have a volume responsive kind of time. If you've got a big IPC, it doesn't mean they won't be volume responsive. Now, you will see tables like this in echo textbooks. I was made to learn one like this if you want to an echo. And there's, there's certainly some basis for it, but often when you try and find the references for the table, <coughs> and as far as its applicability to the sort of resource emergency situation, I think it's bollocks. Thank you for it. So I've disregarded it, I don't even measure it now. There is a correlation between IBC balance and flexibility and CVP, but really, no one cares what CVP it is a bad indicator of volume status and sometimes of uh, fluid responsiveness. And it has been said where I live that only a window that can use this CVP to make clinical decisions regarding fluid management. <laughs> so, the real volume question, all right, and we don't want to be window is does this patient have fluid responsive play it out there? Try to answer it. What does the IBC tell us? It tells us how stretched the vessel is, so how big it is, tells us how stretched it is, which will depend on volume, but will also depend on, on pressures around it. And then how much it changes when you breathe um, really is, is how much it's responding to pressure changes. And the way a pressure changes the volume, or the volume changes to pressure, is called compliance, isn't it? And everything in physiology has a compliance curve that looks a bit like this. So a flat bit and a steep bit. All right, so if you're fairly full, as it were, you've got lots of volume, and you're on a flat bit of the curve. So as you breathe in and out, those changes in pleural pressure, as they're transmitted to your IVC, but even if they're quite big changes, you'll only have a small change, and it causes a small change in IVC volume. Right? So if you're fairly full, it's a high CVP state, you're on a flat bit of the curve, and you're not going to see much respiratory variation in IVC size. So conversely, if you're on the steep part of the curve, breathing in and out is going to cause big changes in IVC size. Okay. 
that's really the essence of understanding the compliance. But the clinical utility of this isn't entirely clear. So, because there are various things that can affect the pressures in the body. So here's, um, here's a patient with pneumonia and sepsis who's hypovolemic respond to fluid. They've got their toxin like you see. This is our patient that we saw earlier with the tampon. He's got a fat, juicy IVC that doesn't collapse. So it certainly supports a big, fat, juicy, non-collapsing IVC. It will certainly support your suspicion of an obstructive cause of shock. If I think there's tampon, I think there's massive PE. And I see a big, fat, non-collapsing IVC that supports my suspicion. If I think this patient's hypovolemic and they've got a tiny IVC that's collapsing completely, I'm probably going to die. Anywhere in between those two extremes is where there's debate in the literature and inconsistency in the science. There is, of course, a difference between spontaneously ventilating patients and patients who are on mechanical ventilation receiving positive pressure. There's still a relationship, but it's reversed. So when you breathe in on mechanical ventilating with positive pressure, uh, your IVC gets bigger, not smaller. And in fact, that's been validated slightly better than in spontaneously ventilating patients. But they're mechanically ventilated, well sedated, so all the breaths are being delivered by the machine, and you've got significant variation in IVC diameter with each breath, you're probably going to have a volume response in time. But the good thing is we don't have to interpret it in isolation. We're not trying to estimate the CVP in an echo report that we're then submitting to someone. We're having a look at this patient, taking the history, examining them, they might have their heart, the right to see, or have a look at their lungs, uh, all the stuff we're practicing. And uh, so this old boy that looked like he had a bit of failure, uh, a bit of formula edema on his chest x-ray, he had a history of heart failure and a history of COPD came in breathless but looked kind of dry. The reason we have fluids, it's hypertensive, it's hypoxic. Um, and he had this apical view of his heart. He's got no fluid around the heart. The RV size, we can't really pull it off, we can't see it. But the LV, look what's happening to this endocardial board as they're meeting, the opposite sides of the heart are meeting, that's called a kissing ventricle. That's a sign of hypervolemia. The collapsing IVC, kissing ventricle, is hypervolemia. It's gone to fluid. Yeah. Did you all understand him cut right, like in the picture, or did he write the right line? Probably line, small line, oh, small line. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For, for the heart, yeah. The subcostal one goes right there. Thereby ruling out the ventricle. Okay, so. Well, there's a whole bunch of things, as I said, that affect your IVC. Where you measure it's important, what view you're taking. And some things will make it bigger, and some things will make it smaller. I was teaching basic cardiac ultrasound to um, treating doctors just last week, and uh, we had a, an Italian emergency doctor who was on elective with our service, and he volunteered to be the echo subject. I thought that was great. Took a shot, pretty ripped, obviously very athletic, sick, did a lot of swimming. His IVC was enormous, it was enormous, but bore no relation to most of the patients we see. <coughs> I doubt his CVP was 20. I'm pretty sure he didn't have obstructive shock, but he had an enormous IVC. If you can only do it in hospital, I'm not interested in it. So, this is what I quite like by the hospital, because you can do it in the ambulance or something. Some of the IVC, which was fun, but you know this one from the patient. drugs, positive pressure ventilated, and so much It's worth it. All right, uh, here's a young lady with pneumonia and uh, severe sepsis. She's hypertensive. That's a hyperdynamic ventricle. What's the view? What axis are you looking at? It's a axis. Correct. As a short axis, you get all of these kind of hyperdynamic. Typical core chamber, good up down wing of the valves, good change in chamber size, RV is not enlarged, so if you're a big one. And her IVC is completely collapsing in the respiration. Okay, so that's what I'm finding out for this tiny thing to do with collapses, or it's being juicy and unsuspecting and obstructive. 
So coming back to purified effusions and tamponade physiology, remember someone jumping up and down the ventricle suggests that it looks like someone's passing up and down, and that's probably the way the vascular collapse. And uh, Mike, did you invent that? No, I think it's Chris Fox. Right, I love it. Great. So Chris Fox, I think, yeah. And he's got some echogenic uh, thrombus within his purified effusion. And another feature of tamponade physiology would be the fat. Long collapsing, I would see that you see here. I'm not changing at all. Respiration. Okay. A female in her 30s, just hypotensive and dyspneic. What view is this? How's it on short axis? Brilliant. So, Buddha and Mark, no. The army bit, flattening the septum. Yeah, I think there's some flattening there. Cervical view. So the RV should be smaller than the LV. That should be about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 times the size of the LV. And that's actually bigger than the LV. That's, that's abnormal, isn't it? I think someone's commenting on the septum. Yeah. What, what can you see? Paradoxical shift. Brilliant. It's paradoxical septal motion. So the way the septum is moving is in the opposite direction from where you would expect it to move. I'll explain that. Normally, the opposite walls of the left ventricle in systole go towards each other, and then the lattice and lastly go away from each other. If my right ventricle is here, this is my septum, this is the opposite wall of my left ventricle, this is what should be happening. But because of the high right sided pressures from the peak PE, what happens is that at a part of the cardiac cycle, when the left ventricle relaxes, the pressure on the right becomes greater than the pressure on the left. And then push the septum into the left ventricle as the left ventricle is relaxing. So rather than that, you get that paradoxical septal motion. So question, is this 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 a useful measurement to do? That is, can you pick up cell uh, cases of a biventricular uh, environment that you wouldn't just see by a salt? Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I don't do measurements, so I'm looking for the big stuff. And I think the take home for basic cardiac assessment is the signification of the more obvious the pathology and ultrasound. But if it's subtle enough to require measurements, to me, we can wait for someone else. So with a big RV, we've got paradoxical perceptual motion. Here's a subclassical core chamber. Big RV. So the big fat GC, IVC, non collapsing, consistent with instructive for the shot. Male 49, profoundly hypoxic, he was normotensive, and he had gone to his family doctor that morning to say, My leg's swollen. And the family doctor said, You sprained it. He said, Yeah, but you know when I had that clot in my leg that I had to go on those blood thinners for four to six months? It feels just like that. <laughs> And the family doctor said, Oh, he sprained it. And he went home. And he was advised to rest it. He sprained it, he rested it. So he went home and rested his leg and he got really breathless. We were flummoxed, just scratching our heads. So what could possibly be wrong with this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so we did a basic cardiac ultrasound. And got no good around the heart. He's got a big heart in the back of himself. <laughs> if you're lucky, you might get a patient like this. He's got a bit of thrombus floating around the eye. You see, or this is probably shock man. He's going to have thrombus in the right side of the heart, sticking in the arm. It's quite possible to have it. But you don't know what's in the problem if you know the inner signs of an acute or poor heart. This is an elderly man who had dyspnea and hypotension. <laughs> Chest x ray? What could be going on here? Hypertensive, volume, palm, obstruction. Who's going for volume? No, who's the volume? Sorry? It could be palm or obstruction, couldn't it? Yeah, you could have a big fusion. And fair value fusion, it's not. You could have a big dilated block, very well functioning. 
Let's have a look. What view would you like to see first? What's the best kind of view? Personal analysis, that's right. Let's uh, have a look at that. Has he got food around the heart? Yes. Yes. yes, all right, so he has. So if you see fluid around the heart, you've got to ask the question, is it fluid or is it fat? There's, there tends to be a different density and the profile of fat tends to be more visible anteriorly. But sometimes the profile of fat pad can be a bit like fluid. He's got fluid all over now. Is it pleural or pericardial? Well, it's pericardial. Um, but the way to confirm it is just kind of a filled space and perhaps it's this morning. Um, but if you saw fluid back here, you might think it's pleural or pericardial. And you can't see it very well here, but the, the descending aorta appears as a black circle just underneath the left atrium. And pleural fluid, left pleural effusions appear deep to that, whereas pericardial effusions are between it and the heart. This is pericardial, septic fluid. And the next question, if you think yes, it's pericardial fluid, is is there tampon physiology? By which we mean white atrial or white atrial and calcite collapse? And a large amount of vaccine. Doesn't look like anyone jumping up there on the bench for. Okay. BP, look, B, RB, that means septum. Not the really B, is it? That's not bigger than the LB. What about pump function? Global assessment of LB solid function. Four. Yeah, that'll do. Right? It's got a pump function. So the I think more than before, it isn't really changing much between the system vastly. The anterior mitral valve, we went to no acceptance. It's got markedly impaired on this sort of function by gross visual assessment. That's what I would like. Uh, and he has a very um, valuable confusion. And we'll all be the speech to account our physiology on basic TV ultrasound. It's a weird view. Alright, so it's a pacing wire and dry ventricle. Got these uh, large thin chain lifts that aren't very much. So these two have got a cardio mobility. The guy we see is what we'd expect for his heart failure and for obstructive positive shock. So again, it's not helpful. So it's a reminder of the cautious. And uh, it was massive and not collapsed. All right. So that X-ray would make us suspect the possibility of tamponade, a big pericardial effusion. He had a pericardial effusion. That's a feature of his heart failure. True. Here's the last case. The male in his fifties came in dyspneic and hypoxic. What view is this? Is there fluid around the heart? Is there a big RV at the inception? Yes. What's his LV pump function like? It's a good special assessment. Okay, yes. That's the stable for change of view. What a great picture. Fluid around the heart pretty much to tell the sign of it. He looks at the perceptual motion. Fair and juicy, I can see. What's he got? What's he got? So he had, um, he had the idea as he said, it's probably from a formal infection. And the, I put that as the last case just to remind us all that everything we know about depends upon this. So other causes of acute and chronic respiratory failure can give you cardiac appearances of some acid or massive injury. So you've got someone without previous cardiopulmonary disease. If you chest x ray those features, that's going to be specific. It can be someone with this on the x ray, this lung pathology, which isn't the ears, and of course, that's growing on the heart, that acute fault. Okay, so think about what we've just covered. And there's three plus three forces of hypertension or PE and depressed. Combine that with the class count we did this morning, think about volume pump. And structure for all of our shock patients, whether it's trauma or medical presentation. Any questions? Okay. We'll be to ask questions during the practical or email me or 
We'll get this up going in just a second. Um, let's see. Sorry about the delay. Well, that was a very impressive introduction. I'm honored to be here. Um, I've heard so much about Castle Fest, and uh, it was really a thrill uh, to be invited. And hopefully, I can meet at this. It is beautiful. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm definitely an ultrasound zealot, so there'll be uh, kind of a, um, a few messages uh, in this talk, but uh, I'm going to talk about vascular access. And uh, the first time I ever tried ultrasound with vascular access was 
probably about 1993 <coughs> to 94. It didn't work out so well for me. So it took some years uh, for me to catch on. Plus, I was trained in a fairly hardcore uh, program where we were taught uh, by surgeons that we'll get access uh, in anything, we'll get blood from uh, anything as well, uh, even potentially a rock. Um, we've got several uh, objectives we're going to uh, talk about evaluating uh, vasculature, preparing prior to the procedure, uh, best approaches, and uh, I won't be subtle about uh, my opinion on this and why, um, as far as in plane or out of or short or long axis technique. Now we're going to talk about my days of clavia, peripheral line briefly. And probably something that's even more interesting to people once they've done this a few times is recovery from failure, meaning your line isn't going so well, your line placement, uh, and various pitfalls and tricks. I uh, actually have no disclosures uh, for this lecture, but the way this unique uh, disclosure read, I have to talk about everything I ever did. Uh, so I've, I've done a bunch of consulting for people with usually product development. So but, uh, you won't pitch anything in this talk except my own. I had advised psychotic ideas on vascular access. <laughs> so we've had the basic ultrasound uh, physi or sorry, uh, physics talk. Uh, you know that uh, veins should be dark, uh, solid things uh, with, uh, with no air in them uh, should be uh, fairly bright. The thyroid is more solid than the oxygen and the carotid. Um, and uh, that's one basic way we can evaluate. We can also use color doubler. And this is where a lot of analysis like myself uh, uh, several years ago go wrong. Uh, for me, in my fellowship, uh, for the first few months, I tended to put color on everything. The machine I trained on originally, at one facility, didn't have color out there. The other one I did. So when I got a hold of color, everything uh, got colored out. Uh, just be aware uh, of this, uh, where the mind, bark, blue, way, red, towards. But notice how easily that can be switched. Uh, and, and I'm still surprised how many people leave a course thinking, okay, red is uh, for the heart, the machine somehow knows this. This is clearly not the fact. Um, also, depending on how your setting is, you can get both red and blue uh, colors in the uh, vein or artery. And effectively, this is more of a tool for identifying flow, perhaps looking at flow characteristics to some degree. And if you turn on a power doctor, uh, depending on the machine you're using, you may get no indication of. Uh, uh, flow direction at all, so be aware of this. Uh, this is a nice IJ, and a couple of things to notice here. Uh, in, even though IJ shouldn't, in many people's minds, they pulsate all the time, and you get a mosaic flow pattern like this uh, that is somewhat reminiscent of an artery. Color got, or power got, the same thing, a lot of turbulent flow. Part of that is because of the proximity to the heart, uh, the health of the patient, and uh, the uh, uh, carotid is sitting pretty close uh, just underneath it. So pulsation is transmitted through the wall. Um, also, you have to be careful about the sensitivity on your machine. How is it set? When you fire up a machine, depending on who's used it before, unless it automatically goes back to a preset, you, it's very much like a box of chocolates. You really don't know what you're going to get, which probe is going to pop up, um, what the settings are going to be. So depending on what the settings are like, you can have uh, your flow decrease to almost no flow within a vessel. This carotid, it's not occluded. We just changed the, uh, the Doppler sensitivity, so we're still getting some flow in this IJ. Do I assume that this is the best, uh, this is the vein, this is the artery? It can be very confusing initially uh, if you're brand new to ultrasound, so be careful. The ultimate, and you know, people sometimes don't like to teach uh, pulse wave Doppler initially, uh, the ultimate way to decide if something's an artery or a vein is pulse wave Doppler. And when used correctly, this is very helpful. It's a good technique to know. And almost every machine now that's available in a point of care setting can get you uh, a trace. Very helpful for differentiating vessels. And uh, a reminder that uh, even in this case, you can differentiate the IJ from the carotid. The tracing is much more chaotic, but it was clearly different from the one we just saw before. So even if the visualization is not that good and you're panicked, perhaps it's a very sick patient, you can rely on pulse rate doctor to guide you whether something's an artery or a vein. Uh, this is a Flavian view. Uh, the artery and veins sit on top of each other occasionally. Uh, they seem to reverse position or sit next to each other. It can be very confusing. Everything is pulsing or pumping. It is very helpful in these cases to turn on some pulse wave doppler and take a look at your uh, potentially uh, cannulate. In this case, I don't know if you saw a, a, a valve in the vein briefly, but still helpful differentiating from the other view we had. Although very chaotic, not the type of venous waveform we're used to look. <clears throat> And this has definitely bailed me out of a number of trouble spots. 
So basic principles, principles of ultrasound guidance, they're the same. Uh, although this may not seem intuitive, I think peripheral um, venous access is much harder than central venous access. Uh, the stakes are different. You're much less likely to kill somebody with uh, peripheral intent, which can definitely do so uh, with central lines, but uh, I think it's still hard. What you need is a probe, a linear probe, ideally. Uh, there's literature out there and some microconvex probes, neonatal, et cetera. The ranges now are obviously not just 5 to 13 megahertz, uh, but if, you're new, if you have a 17 megahertz probe, uh, it's going to be tough working in a very thick net. I think color doppler is helpful and spectral doppler are also helpful, although not absolutely needed. But the more tight the situation, in other words, the sicker the patient, uh, the more stressed you are, the uh, more challenging the view, the, the better it is to have all these extra tools. You need a sterile field and probe, uh, obviously some practice, hopefully on some, something inanimate, something that can't smack you or sue you. Uh, and uh, some people choose to use a needle guide. Uh, I don't like those. The very first one I tried, I threw away, stayed away from them since. Uh, they have matured over the years. There are needle guides which are very flexible, can do all sorts of angles. There's a, uh, a needle guide that now slips over your probe. The only problem with that is you come into your plate and only one trajectory, you're probably going to drill the posterior wall. And even though 100 pigs survived it, we'll see how the humans fare with it because you can't change your angle. But uh, it does help you guide your needle quite nicely. So a lot of people still prefer not to use needle guides. The jury's out. Uh, this is how we used to do uh, sterile uh, ultrasound guided vascular access projects many years ago, or uh, procedures. So whether you use a glove, uh, which is tough to now in North America, or a lot more, much more extensive training, you, know, you want to make sure to adhere to all sterile practices uh, for your hospital. And obviously, you, if you've seen the progression pretty soon, you're going to be covering the entire room with the draping. Uh, I'm not sure what we'll be wearing exactly. It'll take an hour to set up. Obviously, <coughs> sterile gel. Uh, what was interesting about this transducer is I use it for this I want to say photo shoot for this uh, um, photograph, and then I threw it away. This is a huge guy, big net, and I actually did not get this two and a half inch needle down into the IG because this um, uh, guy, or this needle guy ate up so much length. So after this picture, I pulled all that off, threw away this needle guy, which is five hundred dollars. I found out there, I had no idea. Uh, they never used it again, obviously. Uh, the modern ones are a lot better at that. Uh, why not just use static? Uh, Technique or X marks the spot. It probably is better than nothing, but it's not good enough. Uh, several people have looked at this, and you have lower first pass success rates. Uh, you probably have more legal liability. I'll mention the whole legal angle several times too, um, uh, and uh, various meta analyses and policies around the world say that you have to have any guidance, and there's really good reason for it. Um, there are two general approaches to a vessel, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, I have very strong beliefs on which is the best to take in almost every case. Uh, there's a short and long axis, and really what you're talking about is not so much visualization of the vein, although you are, it's uh, visualization of the needle in plane versus out of plane. Uh, and I'll mostly use transverse and short axis, meaning that uh, that's how you're seeing both the vein and uh, the needle as well. Uh, in this view of the IJ, we have a short axis cut through the IJ and then through the parotid. This is a nice relationship. You can kind of stick your right through the IJ, you're probably not going to hit the carotid, it's fairly safe. Uh, and this one, not so much. In fact, uh, you can come in and hit the IJ and go just a little too deep. The patient is very hypoxic, perhaps hypotensive, and next thing you know, you're in the uh, carotid. And that can obviously cause uh, significant complications. So in the transverse approach, you line up over your target. Hopefully the, uh, the line, the midline will be right here. There are many machines that will actually offer a dotted line like that to be displayed on your screen so you can kind of follow the midline of the transducer. There are hidden microphones on me, obviously. Now I know I'm not white in that. Gotta check my room. Uh, so you basically uh, stick the needle uh, underneath the skin and you watch it progress uh, into the vessel and hopefully stop. Uh, uh, before you get to be, and you have to keep track of the needle's progress by adjusting your transducer. How do you do that? Well, here's your needle. It's going to go straight in like that, but there's your ultrasound beam. So you're not going to see the tip of the needle or any other point. Obviously, your picture the entire time can remain like this. If this is the ultrasound screen, here's your needle up on top. Uh, so you have to adjust your transducer. You push it away uh, from uh, the 
injury prone to the skin, watch the needle tip progress, and then hopefully indent on the vein, uh, and then pop straight into it. And notice how far the transducer has gone from being just over the needle uh, injury point all the way out here. And this is very important to do, or otherwise the mistakes can happen. This is an ancient, ancient image, um, gosh, from like 1989 or 90. And even here, we're usually mostly uh, using a transverse approach. You can see the needle tip, the shadow, and we thought we were in on this case, and it's not always uh, what happens. Here is uh, ideally how you do a uh, uh, short axis approach. Uh, this is more simulating somebody that is not uh, too familiar with it. You move your vein around, you adjust it, you put it straight in the middle of the screen. Ideally, you're close to it, now let's get that perfectly. And then you can drive your needle in. And you can see if you're right over it. Now, I did not adjust my transducer position, so as I do, I realize that I'm actually on the side of the vessel. In fact, I'm almost going in. And problems happen when people lose track of where their vessel is uh, and what the needle tip is doing. And this is what happens in short axis. You have your uh, vessel coming out of the screen towards you in this case, and you're cutting with a transducer or with ultrasound beam straight down. It's actually uh, an ideal uh, method um, when you first look at it. And the way I always imagine it is if you're off on your vessel, you can see where you're off, where the needle is by. In this case, you've gone all the way through, that's bad, all the way to the side, and now you're right in the middle. Except, uh, especially in the heat of battle, most of us get these kind of images. There's a dot, there's a dot, Okay, finally I'm in the vessel. So that's good. Uh, I load my wire, I put in my uh, you know, garden size, garden hose size cordis, and I feel good about it. Um, problem is, what if you actually went all the way through? You were simply scanning at this point. And for those of you that uh, are sitting there telling yourself right now, oh, I'd never do that, nobody ever does that. It actually happens all the time. There's a case uh, within a not too long a driving distance of here uh, where our position is now. Uh, defending themselves uh, because the patient had an extremely bad outcome because of that. And I have probably uh, three or four other vascular access related cases. Uh, um, the ones where ultrasound was used was also for all short access, and we'll talk about this more um, when there's several where ultrasound was not used. And look at that, what happened? I lost track of the needle, and suddenly the next time I adjusted the transducer, it was all the way through. Uh, this is very easy to do. I'm not saying it's not easy to do under a long axis, but we'll see why it's a little bit different. This is just a common pitfall. Uh, there are plenty of people that are pretty good at this. Uh, the problem is um, there are situations that are ripe uh, for uh, inappropriate adjustment of the transducer, just losing the needle tip and going all the way through. Now, we had a discussion about this earlier. How did we used to do this blindly? If anybody remembers doing it? We were through the vein all the time. I mean, who knows what I used to buy when I go all the way through. You just <laughs> jab it into the harpoon and you pull back and you got blood. And the reality is many of these patients live. Uh, some got chest tubes. Uh, for me, that was great as a resident. I love doing chest tubes. Um, <laughs> some didn't necessarily do so well. We're, we see those cases periodically. Now, short axis versus long axis. Obviously, uh, there's a debate about that. Uh, novices always tend to gravitate to short axis. It's just easier. That's the way you find vessels to begin with. Why turn and go long axis over something? We found that, uh, that there was uh, mean cannulation time was shorter. People just seem to prefer it. Uh, but depending on whose study you look, uh, there are some advantages. And probably the advantages are borne out over time in terms of complications. Um, you know, how much trouble can you get into with using short axis instead of long axis? And not a lot of people publish their you know, bad cases. In this room that I know of, there's one foolish enough to publish them, and one brave enough. I was the one foolish enough, and Mike Stone was the one brave enough to, uh, to publish a case. So we looked at six accidental arterial cannulations. Uh, the, there was one death um, because of them, um, two airway losses. And this is a uh, state patient. Look at that IJ. This is unfortunate downward. Uh, the IJ is obviously collapsing uh, completely in this case. And that needle, this is all we got uh, from the videotape. Needle went all the way through, uh, and uh, the patient uh, received a cortis and a carotid, and then went on to lose the airway later when we really recognize this. Now you ask yourself, how can I not recognize it? The blood is going to squirt at the ceiling, perhaps go to all the way to a different room in the emergency department, and it's going to be bright red and seen. That's not the case. Who are we putting these lines into? Hypoxic, hypotensive patients. Blood is dark because it's not oxygenated, and it trickles out. 
And the case I just mentioned a little while ago, that's exactly what happened. In fact, that the physician, he or she actually documented in their chart. I put the line in, blah, 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 I did my procedure, and the blood drip out slowly, and it was gone. And still resulted uh, in a horrible outcome, and hopefully it will prevent it from being a huge payoff. Another one, uh, the IJs missed just a little bit, if you can see it. Uh, this is all we were able to really recover. Um, and uh, the, uh, the needle went right to the product that's figured out. This is a federal one. Uh, this is uh, one I put in with the resident a long, long time ago. And we thought, there's no way this is arterial. We resuscitated the patient, and the nurse came to me and sure enough said, no, uh, I think that blood is going to squirt out soon. So what happened is we go through the femoral vein here and go and hit the deep uh, femoral artery, the branch of it. And uh, you know, this is back when uh, trauma, we we're all learning, you, know, you put in a massive central line, you pour in blood, et cetera. So of course I managed to put in a deep punch cordis into, a, into this with my resin. Um, uh, here's another one. Uh, this is again a short axis uh, cut. And this time we actually traced the, uh, the uh, guide wire, and simply uh, the resident did not realize it was crossing and not the best blood ever, but you can see it crosses into the cry, but it looked good enough for long enough that it was felt to be confirmatory of a correctly placed IJ, and uh, this patient ended up having a correctly placed cry. Uh, so it didn't work out so well. So, uh, again, I'm very biased towards the Lyons approach, even though it is a little bit hard. Um, you, uh, you see the vein in the long axis, you should see the needle in the long axis too, unless you split and, uh, them up and do a leap approach or something like that. Uh, you have to uh, hand the transducer from side to side and really make a uh, mental note, create a 3D image of uh, the, the, soft, the soft tissue you're scanning through and the vessel you're going to hang. But the beauty is you can see your vein, you can see the shaft of the needle, and uh, the tip of the needle very well. In fact, you, you can make sure that you don't hit this posterior wall in this patient that's about to get TPA, let's say, or uh, a patient that has an INR of 9.0. You can avoid hitting the posterior wall. You can make sure you can't hang like the anterior wall only once. The biggest trouble people have, surprisingly, is that initial turn. And this is kind of simulating what it would be like if you haven't practiced this a lot, slowly turning your transducer to keep uh, the vein in the center of the screen elongating it uh, with each turn, and if you screw up, just go back and elongate it more. That is a beautiful view. Uh, you should be able to handle that fairly easily. As opposed to the cross-sectional image, you're now looking at long axis, and this has some inherent pitfalls. You're not looking over here, you're not looking over there, and that's how you can lose your uh, needle. The beauty is, you can lose your needle, but you shouldn't be fooled if you're looking at the tip, like you can the short axis, and be looking at the shaft. Um, so, even though there's difficulty to it, there's a certain beauty to it because uh, if you don't see your needle, you have to stop and find your needle. And if you want to cover the entire vessel and look through your needle, you have to move your transducer or pan or pan your transducer, whatever the terminology you want to use. The key is never move your transducer and needle at the same time. That is how I've gotten in trouble. That's how I've gotten. That's how my residents and fellows have gotten in trouble. If you move the transducer, don't move the needle. If you move the uh, needle, don't move the transducer, or you'll get lost. All right. So, uh, and here's an example of uh, not moving, uh, moving one or the other. Uh, this is a, it looks like a slow methodical um, process, but once you practice at it, this happens automatically and it happens in a matter of seconds. These kinds of uh, uh, adjustments are very automatic. So, I can decide which side I'm going to see the needle on. This bus. Uh, so many people, I don't know which side the needle's coming from. Well, put your finger underneath, one side of the transducer, or move the transducer in one direction or another. Where does the new information come on the screen? That's where the needle's going to come from if you put the needle on that side. So, needle's going in, I don't see it right away. I jiggle the needle just a little bit, look at that. I don't even move in and out very much more than a millimeter, so I'm not going to hit something. But I realized I was off axis, I decide which direction I am off axis or off the vessel. And I drive the, uh, the needle in the reverse direction slowly, incrementally, and I can line up right over the vessel. Here I'm getting over it more and more often, and then I, I can pretty much go ahead and cannulate. I can see the needle tip, make sure I don't hit the poster wall. This is beautiful. Now, uh, this beautiful on a mannequin, um, but it can be beautiful in uh, actuality as well. This can be a very nice, smooth process. This isn't actually the most smooth process. This is a, a knowledge trying with, uh, with some one-on-nurses. 
Uh, but here's an eagle coming in. Uh, he doesn't visualize it right away, but it's coming in here. Hang lights nicely, stays clear of the posterior wall. And uh, we talk about, well, if you push it in way up there, and the needle hub was almost at the uh, top uh, wall, the, the catheter wouldn't go in. So, but now you push the catheter off, you can see that it's actually in. You can avoid uh, many failures. You don't have to go to another site. You don't have to blow a vessel. And for those of you that are putting these in so you can get a contrast injection uh, for a CT angiogram, you know what happens when the suckers are loose and they've got a big, huge arm and this way now it's just going to happen. So, this, uh, this is a very slick uh, way to do lines, even though uh, it is a little bit more challenging with that. We knew that uh, the catheter would deploy on top of the vein because the tip of the needle was screwed, but uh, the catheter wasn't through. Remember, uh, it's surprising how far, uh, how far back the catheter actually is. And this is another great lesson because you can't tell this on short axis. So when we see the, uh, the needle come in, uh, it'll stop right about here. And the tip is through, the catheter is actually still outside the anterior wall, and it'll literally push the wall down over the tip of the vessel, if done correctly, and the catheter will deploy anteriorly. I have, unfortunately, uh, dozens of videos of that uh, from different projects. So you push it further in, and you wouldn't know that in short axis. Um, why should clinicians really use this? Um, a number of people have uh, studied this, uh, and um, like things were on paper together, uh, you lose track of your needles at low uh, We started out doing a completely different project and had to write it very um, differently than we anticipated. We looked at 25 EM residents um, and uh, we snuck a peek. We decided to look at what was really happening uh, to them in short axis. So we were doing this. Uh, I guess a lot of the residents didn't realize that uh, the the beam is almost 180 degrees from the vaginal probe, so I can scan underneath their um, transducer. And uh, we had a lot of people uh, not know where they ended up, not end up in the eye. In fact, we had a lot of people go all the way through. And even this unrealistic phantom, because a carotid is not right next to the like it is in most humans, uh, in this particular phantom model is an older one, it's like halfway up out of the table. But people still manage to cannulate the carotid. So, uh, it's very easy to get lost. All right. Uh, now we talk about carotids, veins, or uh, arteries. You know, they're tougher than veins, which we class so easily. But veins can be pretty tough too, uh, especially veins that are older or have been scarred before. So it's very important to uh, keep track of how you're lining up with your needle. A lot of times you do have to come in at a very sharp angle like this, but if you pop through here, you're going to go through both sides uh, of this vessel, and this is how complications start. So you may just have to hook uh, the vessel wall and then flatten out even more so you can push as far as you want to into the vessel. And this is what happens in hypotensive patients, uh, whether it's the IG or peripheral vein. And this you can do in long axis. I think it's much harder to do in short axis. Obviously, you can drop a needle without ultrasound at all, um, change the angle of attack here, uh, but you can visualize this in long axis and be safer. There is some debate that arose for a while whether you want to bevel down or bevel up. We looked at this. Uh, that will all tend to cause more problems, especially with a tougher vein, and actually have to be able to ride up on top. Uh, so the standard is still that a lot, but uh, people have their own preferences. All right, what about some actual uh, usage? Uh, a couple of reminders about the jugular. The anatomy can vary greatly. Uh, this is simply during respiration with Valsella, we go from no IJ to a great IJ, so I put those patients in uh, Trendelenburg, and uh, notice right now you're safe, the uh, product is out of the way. Um, this is if the neck moves. Yeah, that, that IJ went away completely uh, with the head uh, rotating over. So be worried about the position of the patient. Try to uh, optimize it. This is uh, the reality. Uh, the vessels aren't side by side. This is a massive IJ. Now, yeah, it's huge. You're less likely to miss it. But what if the patient's super sick? What if this IJ is actually collapsing quite a bit because uh, they're not truly this uh, fluid overloaded? That carotid is right below, just eagerly willing to receive the largest line uh, and to set as quickly as possible. The reality is, it doesn't happen often, but I'll tell you the cases I've been on trying to defend, the plaintiff's attorney said, Wait a minute, you have ultrasound, you don't make mistakes anymore, and you still manage to injure my client? And you know, uh, uh, so uh, be aware of that that uh, the plaintiff's attorneys uh, have gotten hold of all this stuff. 
Now, heaven forbid you actually do a line uh, without using ultrasound, but uh, that's really a detection. And actually, we're seeing a lot of those cases uh, because the standard of care, quite clearly, well documented, uh, has to have a line. Now, almost all of you probably have somebody in your department that says, I've been doing this for 20 years, 30, 15,000 years. I'm not going to do ultrasound now. The problem is, they'll have a complication eventually. And the plaintiffs uh, will do their interrogatories and they will find out that other people in the department do ultrasound. Perhaps anesthesia does all the lines of ultrasound or surgery. And then you're host because you're not meeting even the standard of care that's uh, being used in your department. So uh, I was in Nashville talking to 130 or something that uh, medical directors from different EDs this past Monday. Um, and uh, that question came up, and that's what I said. I said, this is a scenario I've had to listen to the court on and uh, try to uh, give us a testimony on. And uh, there's some, if anybody else, I mean, even across town, if somebody's using ultrasound, they're not. How does that look to a jury? Well, I've been doing this for 30 years. Okay? For a model of that says you shouldn't be anymore. Uh, you, you're not going to survive in the case, I'll be honest. I've got uh, a few like that here. Dealing with right now, it's not so good. All right, um, not completely lost my place. So we have this vessel, and we're trying to cannulate. Here's a needle coming in. Don't forget, choose your angle. It doesn't have to be 45 degrees exactly. And if you're off just a little bit, uh, don't be too persistent. Try to cannulate regardless. Pull that needle back, readjust, and here we have a very nice. Look how tough that vein is. Look at that wall. It's just tenting completely. This is a reality people forget about veins, and this is why it's really nice to have that long axis view. In short axis, you can actually think you're in the vein by that point, because remember that needle, it was in the middle of the IJ. In short axis, that should look like it's incomplete. We have, why does your wire have to be, or if you're wire fed, why does your line have to be? Uh, you can't see that unless you're seeing it. Uh, this is also a tough one. Uh, try this in short axis, uh, very tough. There, no, it's not there. No, it's there. No, it's not there. So, timing. Uh, if the same patient, and if you want to time this cannulation, you're probably going to have to come in long axis and wait for the patient to do whatever it is, uh, somehow open up their IJ just enough, flatten that needle, and you'll eventually be able to get it in and really get it successful in that case. Uh, this is another method. Nobody could feed a line in, multiple lines done. Did you notice how tight that was? There's a stenosis here. We were able to get that guide wire through. The triple lumen fit in there nicely. There was still lots of room, but blindly, um, we just weren't able to do this. Um, and here's the problem is because I had to drive the needle and point the wire directly down the IJ so it could really come in there and, uh, and place the line. There were no other access options in this patient. Uh, she was that sick for so long. Um, uh, this is a, a great one. It still happens to me all the time. The nurse comes to me and says, you know, I'm very idiot. You can't place lines or anything. We all know that. Uh, you put this line in and it won't flush. Well, I don't think it's even in. You can actually uh, prove to yourself that the line is incorrectly. You can trace it, and uh, obviously, if you have to, you can pull it all the way back and make sure the tip is free of obstruction. Uh, that's really what you need. That is usually if you're up against the wall. This is a line that uh, uh, didn't go so well. Line cannulation pulled the blood back. Look at this. There's just enough blood superior to this thrombus that. Well, my fellow attending at the, uh, this time was jabbing the needle in. He could almost get the wire down, but he just couldn't push all that clot off to the lungs and get, uh, get it out of there. <laughs> so it's very helpful to know that you uh, uh, You're not going to do this widely with uh, the ultrasound. Uh, not the previous picture, but I got called up to my ICU by the director. They needed access to it. This is the position she had to stay in because of multiple neurological problems. So uh, I actually never looked. Uh, at landmarks, I just put the ultrasound probe on, prepped her, and everything. And this kind of looks suspicious like it's coming out behind the ear. I didn't realize that until after it pulled the drapes off. But the reality is, on ultrasound, I knew it was between the skin and my target. I can guide my needle there. And you'll quickly realize if you can see it, you can stick the needle into it. And it was done safely, and she now had access. Uh, I don't know how you get CDP in this uh, uh, position, but anyway, she was septic and shot. And she actually did okay. But um, well, my, uh, uh, the chief of ICU wasn't there for this. He came back later and got fixed. So, wow, what is that? Does it work? Um, so, kind of interesting when you end up. Am I still kind of okay on time? Okay. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, all right, ephemeral logs. Um, Kevin can be useful, and I'll, I'll be honest, when I have a code come in, I still try to do a live ephemeral log really quickly, just for practice, even whatever it is, I just quickly try, and probably about 20% of the time I can't do it, so I don't have all sound machine. Uh, I, I do it under all sound, but I still have that satisfaction. And there is this whole debate amongst foolish people, etc., uh, educators who work during bar, and uh, and we say, well, you know, some of our residents are graduating now without ever having put in a blind line. And nobody knows the significance of that is, but I suppose there'll be plenty of people graduating that uh, have only done uh, intubations under uh, wide scope, I can say, under uh, video or other scopes and uh, those types of uh, tools. So it happens. Yes? Does ultrasound um, being held to the same standard as the lines? Because I think that those probably tend to be put in more blindly than so the, the answer is yes, because there's literature that says it helps with that too. Uh, the caveat you can work is that I did this in a code, and that's why I went into ephemeral artery. Now, I used to believe that if in a code, the patient's dead, you stick the femoral artery, and even if they have a bad outcome, you can just say that. Uh, like there's a case from Hackensack, New Jersey, where the guys worked really hard, put in a femoral uh, catheter, that ended up going into the uh, femoral artery, the uh, patient ended up losing a leg, um, $5 million. There's no reason to put in a thermal line blind when you have the ability to put an IO. If you, someone comes in extreme, you can put an IO and you can go back and do your ultrasound guided uh, access later. You, you can. I actually tend not to do IOs. Uh, in a real <coughs> they often last 10 seconds. Almost every IO I get from the field, I have to check. A lot of times it's not working. I've never had that. All of our IOs work fine and they take about 15 seconds. I, we, what we encounter is um, IOs fail, and nobody knows that they fail. That's the problem. Um, whereas a blind, if I can get a blind stick uh, demo, I can do it uh, probably one pass like that. And I can put the guide wiring, and on all time you can do it very quickly too. Uh, so I just IOs have limitations. Plus, uh, if you can get the definitive line at that time, I think you can do it. If you can't get a line of any type, I agree, IO is a great backup. And and when it does go bad. Uh, figure that out in ultrasound because you're feeding the fluids into the muscles. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a great tool, but in certain settings, I just think ultrasound kind of trumps it by and large. And now that you have very good needle guides, uh, you can probably do the femoral or whatever line even faster. Um, you know, that's a uh, tough approach. So, under femoral, under ultrasound guides, femoral veins, make sure they're patent. Um, don't do what uh, we did in the IJ, compress it, make sure it collapses, the femoral artery deforms a little bit. Uh, the femoral uh, vein collapses. And it's, this is simple to do. You just press down, and go press down, there we go, press down, and make sure the, uh, the vein is open. Uh, the artery, this is like looking for a DVT, actually. I guess I'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. The artery stays patent. The uh, femoral vein here collapses. You know that this is a good vein to go into, for instance. Why is it tough blindly sometimes? Because of this. Look at that vein. It is directly under the artery. Uh, unless you come in from an extreme angle uh, blindly, you're going to keep hitting uh, this femoral vein indefinitely. Uh, and I know it would be much faster in this case than if you hit the femoral artery repeatedly, like I did in this patient before we used ultrasound. Um, subclavian lines, uh, also a great option. I think initially people think subclavian, how are you going to get uh, a transducer in that location? Well, remember, uh, an axillary vein changes its name right about here, it's played in, it's the same vein. You can be a centimeter out from it. There's no real difference. You can still uh, have your wire position in the perfect location, but that's probably what you're really going to be doing uh, with a uh, axillary uh, or with, uh, with ultrasound. So here's the clavicle. Uh, usually you're looking for the two vessels right about here. Uh, in short access, this is how they look. Artery vein. One thing to be aware of, and this is interesting, that we do this why 